Hi, I am Andrea Zixuan Zhuang. I'm the director of NGS Lab at Store Base Center in Taiwan. And it's my pleasure to share our ex experiments in incorporating the in-house PGTA service in our uh, PGTA programs. And I hope this information would be helpful for anyone who wanted to have their own PGTA service in uh, their own IP program, just like us. And this is our goal uh, to make every woman here become a mother as soon as possible. That's why we introduced the PGTA at our center. Before we talk about the PGTA, I want to begin with the Poseidon stratification. This system divided the IVF women according to their ovarian reserve and the maternal age. As we already know, with the maternal age increased, the ovarian reserve decreased and the unipolar race in the female X increased. So that's why the older women uh, is so hard to get pregnancy. And this is the guidance for the number of embryo to transfer recommended by the practice committee of ASRM last year. If the non-screen embryos were considered, the number for transfer was recommended to increase with the maternal age increased. If the U-port embryos were considered, then the recommended numbers would remain the same as once across different age spans. Because the chromosome stays in the U-port embryos has been concerned, has been confirmed as normal. And uh, it's, the it's a calculation table derived from our uh, big data at Stroke Center. And uh, you can see with the maternal age increased, the maturation rate and the fertilization rates uh, don't change so much. Uh, it's around 80% and 79, 78% respectively. However, the blastocyst formation rate and the upper rates dramatically decreased. And if you turn these rates together, you could obtain the number of needed eggs for generating a U-port embryos. If the number is very big, ex exceeding the patient predicted, that means she must spend more time on collecting available oocytes and the embryos, then you can recommend her to take the oocyte donation program rather than using her on eggs. So uh, it's very useful in our clinical consultation. Now I'm going to uh, the major part, how to set up a genetic lab for PGTA service. And there are five questions. What is the goal, which is the favorable platforms, when to begin and to update the equipment, how to maintain, and how to improve the entire service? The first question is also the most important one. What the goal is, for the PGTA service? Is it simple embryo selections or to build a more delicate embryo ranking system? If it's simple embryo selections, we only need to distinguish the UPOD and unipod embryos because we already know that clinical outcomes display better in the UPOD embryo transfers according to several uh, previous publications. And I also could show some uh, statics according to our data. The left hand is the U-port single embryo transfer versus the non-biopsied embryo, single embryo transfer. And the right hand is the U-port double embryo transfer versus the non-biopsied double embryo transfers. No matter the number of transferred embryos, the U-port embryo display better reproductive outcomes in the uh, beta HCG and the SOG positive rates, and also the implantation rates. And uh, if the patient asks or two embryo to transfer, maybe she already had a failed cycle before, it, then the simple embryo uh, selection can help you to do the combinations. And this figure display the groups of UPO deaths, UPO plus one non biopsy embryos with better morphology, UPO plus one non biopsy embryo with poor morphology, and uh, non biopsy deaths together. And you can see the trends in the biochemical pregnancy and the clinical pregnancy rates, but this time not in the implantation rate. It's probably caused by uh, the unequal sample size. And uh, now we know the simple embryo selection could help us to uh, plan the, the transfer strategies and to design the um, 
the the options for the single and double amber transfer or even more. But uh, recently, uh, the advanced amber ranking is more popular in the PGTA users. That means uh, the mosaic embryo should be concerned. And the Violetti et al. published a very good, wonderful papers in the last year. They use a huge data set to correlate the reproductive outcomes and the chromosome uh, states in the mosaic embryos. And they found that the reproductive outcome is associated with the affected chromosome lengths, the unimportant percentage, and the uh, number of the uh, affected chromosomes. So that means um, if you want to make a, a, a delicate ranking system, mosaicism must be concerned. And how can we do this in-house? How can we set our, set our um, mosaic calling criteria? We use the cell lines and a couple of clinical samples with non types, And we uh, mix them for simulating the actual mosaic samples. And the, the outcomes of the CCS testing could provide us to divide the threshold and the cutoff values for the mosaicisms in the sample with different karyotypings. So that's how we um, establish our uh, calling criteria for mosaicism. Of the mosaicism, I think another issue is the threshold for backgrounds. Uh, for most PGTA users, we would choose the uh, commercialized software for analysis because the manufacturer would provide us a fixed QC values and the procedure was more uh, simpler and faster. And you would find some samples, all the, all the QC parameter were passed, but the pattern is still like this or this, very diverging, very noisy. That means the confidence for mosaic and called callings reduced because we won't know these signals are true to the chromosome state or just derived from the biological or technical effects. So I think for mosaic callings, both the calling criteria and the calling condition are very important. For some conditions, maybe mosaic calling is not workable. You should just do the simple distinguishment between the U port and the port. And um, so the answer of the goal will drive you to choose the most adequate platforms. For example, if you want to do the mosaic calling, maybe the platform with higher resolution are more adequate. Today, the NGS is the most prevalent platforms for the users because it's easier manipulation and flexible turnaround time and a robust ability for uh, body identification. So in the next stage, I would um, share our experiments for uh, lab and system designs based on the NGS platform. If you choose NGS to set up your genetic lab, then the uh, zone division is very important. The clean zone is for the manipulations uh, before the amplifications. And the dirty zone is for the manipulations after amplifications. And these two zones could not be crossed over because the DNA contaminations happen sometimes. Then you can design the power supply, the lighting, the lab table, the sufficient storage space, and the side to put your expensive sequencers. And also uh, sink for cleaning is very important. Uh, I used to, uh, draw the pictures through some free online software and to design uh, the locations and discuss this draft with my teams. And then we can check every step, the workflow, workflows would be fluent or not. And I think it's quite useful to use the, uh, the, the draft to design. Since our uh, PGTA service, um, started in uh, 2014, we already have two rounds for the system estimations. The first round was in 2014, because at that time, both the array CGH and NGS are very uh, prevalent. And we use some clinical samples, send them out to the third party and um, 
compare the identifications and the transfer outcomes between the two platforms. And then we found the NGS performs better in the mosaic and the segmental unimportant calling. So we eventually choose the NGS as our major CCS platform. We uh, leave this data and do some statistics and publish a, a, an article in uh, 2017. And after we uh, started our service, the sample amount grows so fast. So in 2020, we need to reconsider the platforms uh, for accommodating the huge sample amounts. So in these times, we did the parallel comparison again between uh, the manual NGS system and automatic NGS system. So we uh, confirmed uh, the sensitivity, the specificity, and the transfer outcomes. And we use this data to write another paper to publish it on an international journal in 2021. And the procedure become a very good circle. We must figure out something and then we plan an uh, easy experiment to check it. Then we leave the records to uh, write some um, analysis and write a paper, publish it, and use this reference to explain to our collaborators and patients. I think uh, it's a good circle to run this service. And uh, I finished the hard uh, hardware of our lab, and now I'm going to um, share some experiments about monitoring the service. I think there are three major parts for monitoring, the biopsy, CCS testing, and transfer outcomes. The biopsy is the works related to the embryology rooms, including the biopsy cell number, the biopsy cell integrity, and the post-biology morphology of this embryo. So we cooperate with our embryologists very closely. And then we also uh, leave every data derived from our CCS programs. But the most important things I think think is reproductive outcomes, because it's the actual feedback uh, in our patients with this PGTS service. So we build an automatic system to uh, calculate the reproductive outcomes routinely. Another issue for the PGTA is the stability of the non-informative rate, uh, which is related to the biopsy cell number, embryology, uh, embryo morphology and the operations of the lab sites. So we also are uh, monitoring the non-informative race weekly, monthly, and annually. I believe that PGTS service is just like a middle point to link the uh, procedure of uh, IVF and uh, the uh, following transfer cycles. So, um, it's just like a pivot role to check the uh, culturing state and the, the operation uh, state and uh, to provide a standardized starting point for uh, the following transfer program. And uh, besides the retrospective monitoring, we also did some prospective study and this study was motivated by one of our patients. She asked, how can a single biopsy represent the entire blastocyst? So we collected some surplus embryos and biopsies at different locations, including the tropoblast and in the cell mass. And we uh, calculate the concordance rate in the poiety between these different locations. We found the concordance rates uh, between the TE and ICM was approximately 87%. And then we provide this information to our clinical site and help them um, to, un uh, to understand the reliability of PGTS service. And this data also published in 2018. So uh, we did learn so much from uh, these procedures. And uh, in the last few slides, I want to share some experiments and application, applications of the PGTA. And the first is an example of nice to know information. We calculated chromosome specific rates in uh, anupody and mosaicism. And then we found the pattern display very different across individual chromosomes between an important groups and the mosaic groups. And it's just nice to know information, but we 
also published it in uh, the last year. And next one is uh, most known uh, informations. One of one of our patients again asked, if I already took the PGTA, do I need to take additional prenatal testing uh, to check the chromosome state for my baby? So it's very important. We continuously uh, record the uh, prenatal results in our PGTA patients. And we found eight cases out of 2,600 more PGTA cycles display inconsistent results. So um, we uh, talked to our um, clinicians that inconsistency between pre implantation and the prenatal testing existed, but not that high. So it could, it, it's a good reference for them to monitoring uh, the, the entire process of the pregnancy. And uh, if you choose the NGS as the CCS platforms, the additional derived uh, sequence data could be used. And then the mitochondrial DNA content is a good example. And uh, it has been a very popular study topics a few years ago, but uh, the value of mitochondrial DNA ratio in the clinical ap applications remain controversial. Some teams say uh, it's good to be used as an additional uh, embryo selection parameter. Some teams say, no, it's just randomized and it could not be um, implemented in clinical um, embryo selections. So we did the same things. We use our own data and establish the in-house MTDNA ratio and analyze them with uh, embryological parameters and the reproductive outcomes. So we found that the MDDN ratio is highly dependent on the timeline of blastocyst and the reduced MDDN ratio is correlated with uh, the clinical outcomes in day six single UPO embryo transfer. We released this information uh, in the Asia oral presentation last year as well. Now we already uh, have our own PGTA service for a while. And maybe next step, we would consider the NIPGTA because uh, I believe it could be a solution for the patients who had no available embryo for biopsy. But we still have some problems about the inconsistency, the time of clashing the spam media and uh, the contaminations. So we kept looking on this topic and do some um, prospective study. And for, uh, the end, for the end of this talk, I just leave some take home message here. So how can we set up an in-house PGTA service? The first thing is to define a goal. Is it simple embryo selection or advanced embryo ranking? And the answer will drive you to choose the most adequate platform for clinical utilization. And then before launch this service, more uh, some validations are required for setting the coding criteria. And after launching the service, routine monitoring for the operations and the derived reproductive outcomes are recommended. So I hope we can uh, continuously improve the PGTA service because we accumulated more data and we understand the whole procedure with more details. Maybe we can change the single step and fasten the turnaround time and provide our patients a better service in the future. So I hope this information helpful and thank you for your listening and attendance.